All right, uh, God bless you and uh, hope that you're having a great day today. And uh, this lesson is for the Connect Groups for the month of September. And uh, I took quite a bit of time in the month of August to, to vacation and uh, do a couple different things. And so it's great to be back and be, great to be able to bring the word of the Lord to you. Uh, last month, we looked at uh, the life of David at Ziklag, a strategy for his tragedy, and how David handled that terrible, terrible time in his life. And some of the things that he did, you know, he, he got a fresh word from the Lord. Uh, you know, he encouraged himself in the Lord as God. He, he obviously cried and wept. He was honest. He identified the issue. He forsook all and pursued and recovered all. And so God elevated him. Matter of fact, that great tragedy led to David becoming king over Hebron. Uh, excuse me, king over Judah in Hebron. And then seven years later, at age 37, he became king over all Israel. And so that great struggle was a setup for uh, a great success in his life. And that's the way it is with trials. Uh, sometimes we go through a great trial and you think it's the end, but really it actually opens the door for something much better. And so I thought I'd take that same theme about a strategy for your tragedy and look at the life of Jesus. Jesus' worst day, your worst day. What do you do on your worst day? You know, we have those, don't we? And I'd like to take a look at Jesus when he's in Gethsemane, betrayed, and then crucified. That obviously was his worst day. When I say day, I'm talking about not just a 24-hour period, but a day might last three days, might last a week, it might be a season. What do you do on your worst day? Well, in the scriptures, Job had a very, very bad day or season, didn't he? And the Bible says he worshiped God. His wife encouraged him to curse God and die. So those two people handled their worst day entirely different. And obviously, we can handle a bad day, a bad season, a trial, a storm, a lot of different ways. Well, Jesus handled his a certain way, and I'd like to take a look at him. Because I believe if we look at how Jesus handled his worst day, it'll give us great insight and wisdom on how we can go through our worst season, day, time, trial. All right? So the first thing I see is I see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. What does he say? In Mark chapter 14, verse 36, he says, All things are possible for you. <laughs> Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but your will. So Jesus says, all things are possible with you. So he realized that the Father could save him from this trial. He said, this is a cup of suffering. Take it from me. That's my desire. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So the first thing Jesus did is, what did he do? He prayed through to surrender. That's a lot of times we got to do that when we have a bad day. We have to pray through to surrender. We have to commit it into God's hands. You know, you can't wish away a trial. You can't pray away a storm. Many times what you need to do is walk through it. And that's what Jesus had to do. He said, it's my desire, my wish is that I don't pass through this thing. I, and of course, he prayed three times and he didn't pray it away. This was the Father's will. And so he had to go through this storm. He had to walk through this terrible, terrible season in his life. Matter of fact, he called it the hour of darkness. Ephesians chapter 6 talks about putting on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. The evil day is that day of temptation, the day of satanic attack, the day of great trial. And Jesus was facing that right now. And so he's having a terrible, terrible moment here. Terrible, terrible time. And he handled it by praying through to surrender. I have this in my notes here. Three kinds of storms. Storm number one arises from the devil's hands. What do you do? You resist it. Storm number two arises from your own hands. What do I mean by that? You reap what you sow. You know, your bad decisions, your sinful actions has created a storm in your life. What do you do then? You repent of it. And then storms arises from God's hands. What do you do? You surrender to it. And that's what Jesus had to do. He had to surrender to this season, this storm, because it was God's plan to take him to the cross, to go through all that suffering so that he might be the savior of the world so you and I can be saved, right? So he had to surrender to it. Sometimes we need to do that. So pray through to surrender. Number two, we need to learn to forgive those who have hurt us. You know, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, and the next seven steps really are the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross in the order in which they came. 
Uh, so Jesus said when he's being nailed to the cross, Father, forgive them. And so he had to forgive those that have hurt them. Once you know, sometimes you're in a terrible storm because of relational conflict. Uh, you know, one of the greatest stress, uh, stress uh, events in a person's life is relational conflict. And uh, sometimes, you know, people bring great storms in your life or you have relational conflict or you're going through a storm and people don't respond to you the way you want and they hurt you or they offend you. And Jesus, you know, he didn't want to start to get bitter. He prayed to his heavenly father for his father to forgive them. And sometimes you need to do that. You need to make sure your heart is right with people, especially if you, the reason why you're in your conflict is because of relationships that have gone sour. As you always say, don't get bitter, get better. Am I right about that? You got to get better, better rather than bitter. And so Jesus, the second thing he did is he forgave those that had hurt him. And what about you? Do you need to practice some forgiveness? I learned this that if you don't learn to forgive, chances are you're going to go through the trial again. You know, you got to learn your lessons. And this is a big one. If you don't learn to forgive, you got to go through it again. When I taught on the book of Job, I, I mentioned that. You know, Job was sold, was cast into a pit right by his brothers. And then he was betrayed or falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and put in prison. And then he was forgotten, I think it was by the baker, is it the baker or the butler? I always get those two confused. Forgot for an extra two years in prison. Why did he always have to keep going through a very slimmer trial where people uh, betrayed him or, or did evil against him or, or, or offended him? I think God had to teach him true forgiveness so that when his brothers stood before him when he was a prince in Egypt, his heart had learned forgiveness because if he would have been eaten up with bitterness and never learned real forgiveness, he probably would have murdered them or put them to death. Their life was in his hands. He's second in command. They're bowing before him. If he was filled with bitterness, resentment, anger, unforgiveness, he would have killed them. Now, who was one of his brothers? Judah. Who came from the tribe of Judah? Jesus Christ. If Joseph never learned forgiveness, he would have probably taken the life of his brother Judah and Jesus never could have been Savior. That's the importance of forgiveness right there. Number three, you must continue to love and serve people. At the cross, Jesus ministered to one of the thieves at the cross. He says, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. When you, are, when you go through a trial, you'll be tempted to withdraw and isolate yourself. People do that all the time, right? They isolate themselves from people. They isolate themselves from church. They isolate themselves from serving. I'm going through a trial. I need to step down. I'm going through a trial. I can't go to church. They end up withdrawing and isolating themselves. Well, Jesus is on the cross and he's ministering to this person. He, he's bringing him to salvation. He's promising him eternal life. Uh, out of his heart, he's loving and serving people. And I've learned that to have a healthy relationship with God, you've got to continue to look away from yourself. And when, when you go through trial, you want to get inward focused. It becomes all about you. You want people to come to you. They want, you want them to pray for you, to, to, to uh, extend sympathy, empathy for you. Uh, but I learned that you reap what you sow. And as you begin to minister to people in your trial, God then will send people to minister to you. Looking away from yourself to minister to others will keep your spirit healthy. So that's what I see Jesus doing. Uh, number four, how did he handle his worst day? Well, he prioritized his family. He says in John 19, verses 26 and 27, Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. Now Jesus is taking care of his mother by committing her into the hands of the Apostle John. He's going through the worst day and he's thinking about family. And uh, just as we isolate ourselves from people, uh, so we also isolate ourselves many times from our loved ones. You know, when you're going through a very uh, difficult time, maybe your worst time, your worst day, I want you to try to keep your family first. Obviously God's first, but keep your family first in your life. Prioritize your family, all right? And uh, you will find that if you can do that, 
where you know you're not you're not acting out on them you're not impatient with them you're not angry with them i want you to know that your home can come become a refuge it can become a sweet garden a, a place to escape the storm that you're in you know when you get home you're loving your wife you're loving your children or your husband you're, you're making sure they're being ministered to. Uh, you're pouring out your life to them as well. You're keeping that strong, that healthy, and that can become a real oasis for you. You know, my wife and I, we went through a very, very challenging time, and my wife took it upon herself, the responsibility that when I came home, she was going to make sure that the home was ready for me, that she was going to love me, that she was, she even says she's a, she was anointed to anoint my head. And I like that, you know, he anoints my head with oil, my cup runs over. She talks about how she was anointed to anoint my head. And I tell you, she would do that. She would greet me at the door. She would fix me uh, meals. Uh, she'd be very tender. She'd speak life into me. And I, in, in my worst day or worst season of my life, I, I'd go home and, man, this home was great. She didn't add to the struggle. She helped alleviate the struggle. So Jesus is prioritizing his family, he's taking care of business, he's loving on his mom, and uh, you know, that'll help you get through the worst day of your life. Uh, number five is seek God to understand why. Jesus prayed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you know, he asked why. Seek God to understand why. Why is that? Because you know, God's at work in you in seasons of trials and testings and storms. He's at work in you. He's trying to accomplish things in you. And if you can understand why this is happening, you can cooperate with the work of God and quite possibly get out of the trial quicker because God is trying to accomplish something in you in the trial. And if you're just, oh, I don't know what the Lord's doing. I have no idea. You can't cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Ask God for wisdom. Ask God for clarity. In the book of James chapter 1 verse 2, it connects the asking of God for wisdom with going through trials. It says in James 1, verses 2 and 5, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. If any of you lack wisdom, so the, the context is trials, right? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. See how you can ask the Lord for wisdom when you're going through a trial and the Lord will give it to you? Uh, you know, sometimes you pray, you know, why is this happening? I'm trying to work love in your heart. I'm trying to work forgiveness. I'm trying to work patience. I'm trying to work joy. I'm trying to strengthen your faith. I'm trying to build character in you because a promotion is coming your way. You know, I always look at it this way. The things that are happening in your life are one of three reasons. To promote you, to prepare you, or to preserve you. One of those three things. You're going through something, it's leading to a promotion, or you're going through something and it is preparing you, or you're going through something and God is using it to preserve you from the attack of the enemy. So one of three things, whatever you're going through right now, it's either for promotion, for preparation, or for preservation. Ask God for wisdom. My God, my God, why? As Dale Yurton would say, don't let your why turn into a whine. I don't want to do that, all right? The Lord doesn't answer those type of prayers where you're just complaining to the Lord and you're lacking faith and uh, the goodness of the Lord. But if, uh, you know, genuinely come with the Lord, and I will say this, sometimes God doesn't give you the answer to why. It is a walk of faith. But maybe when you do go through it and you look back, maybe you can have some better clarity as well. But I don't think there's anything wrong with asking the Lord for why, and perhaps he will give you wisdom. You can cooperate with the work of the Lord, and maybe that trial can end sooner than if you just uh, don't understand and cooperate at all with the work of the Holy Spirit. All right, what else do we have? Uh, number, number six, keep your passion. That's another way that G Jesus handled his worst day. He kept his passion. You know, I see that in the word, I thirst. You know, he's thirsting. He's thirsting. And I realize he was thirsty in a physical sense. But let's take a look at this in a spiritual, spiritual sense. You know, those that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. That's what Jesus says. Thirsting is so important. Keeping your passion. You know, when you go through a trial, it's like a storm. It's like rain. Trials many times are like rain. 
and uh, a fire can be doused or quenched by the rain. People lose their passion when they go through prolonged trials. It is your responsibility to keep the fire burning. Listen to what it says in the book of Leviticus, chapter 6, verse 13. A fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. That was the direction to the priests. You got to keep the fire burning. It shall never go out. And imagine there in the wilderness, 40 years having to keep this fire burning, and uh, windstorms, sandstorms, rainstorms, attacks of the enemy, traveling, journeying, they had to keep the fire burning. No matter what day it was, no matter what season it was, no matter what was happening in the circumstances, they had to keep the fire burning. God held them accountable, responsible for that. It's the same for us. You might be on a journey, you might be camping, you might be under attack, you might be going through a trial, whatever the case might be, keep the fire burning, right? Keep the passion hot with the Lord. Don't let that trial douse your spiritual fire. Let it, let it stimulate you. The Bible says, uh, fan in the flames, right? Fan in the flames, the gift of God. That's what Paul told Timothy. Fan it in the flames. Serve the Lord with passion in your heart. Be zealous for the Lord. Uh, the next one, number seven, finish well. He says in John chapter 19, verse 30, right? It is finished. Jesus finished well. He accomplished what God wanted him to do. He said it is finished after this. In John 19, 28, he says, all things were now accomplished. And then John 19, verse 30, he says, it is finished. All things were now accomplished. Everything God was trying to do in this terrible season, he did. And now Jesus says it's finished. So you're going through your worst day, your worst moment, your worst season, whatever it might be. God's trying to accomplish something in you and through you and seek to finish well. Finish the season well, finish your ministry well, finish your life well. It should be all of our goals to finish well. You know, I, I think of different things that, are, that I'm still running the race in. I, I'm still running the race in my marriage. Well, I want to finish my marriage well. It'd be terrible to not finish well after 38 years. I put 38 years in it. I'd hate for it not to finish well. I'm trying to finish my ministry here at Cornerstone well. I put in 31 years. And it'd be terrible to not finish the ministry well. And I'm 58. It'd be terrible not to finish my life before God well, my personal individual relationship with the Lord. I want to finish that well. So I have these things. I'm running the race. And uh, each one, I need to make sure I finish well. Then, you know, you go through a certain season of life and you go through that season. Well, you want to be able to let everything be accomplished that needs to be accomplished. So you can say, it is finished. Paul said that. I fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. Right? He said that. I've, I've fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. Now is laid up for me a crown, a crown of righteousness. And he is able to finish his life his ministry, the call of God. Well, one final one, commit your future into God's hands. What do you do on your worst day? You commit your future into God's hands. Into thy hands, I commend my spirit. Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Trials can extinguish your hope. They can extinguish your passion, your fire, but they also can extinguish your hope. And hope has everything to do with the future. You know, when you're going through a very challenging time, you think, man, it's, it's over. Uh, you know, it, this, this is wrecked. Uh, my, my dream is, is destroyed. You know, you can have all these thoughts. I have this quote. Maintaining hope comes from seeing the promises of God in every situation and staying positive despite the circumstances. And so maintaining hope, seeing the promises of God in every situation, you know, God has a promise for everything you're going through, right? Seeing the promises of God in every situation, staying positive, staying hopeful, despite the circumstances. So on Jesus' worst day, he knew that he had a future. He told the, told the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus' future, ultimate future, was not the grave, the end of all things, but the resurrection 
and ascension, and then his ultimate return to this earth in glory. He had a future. And so he's committing his hands and his spirit into God's hands because he knows he has this future. The Father is not done with Jesus. May I say that to you? The Father is not done with you. You also have a future. And so stay hope filled, all right? Stay positive, commit your future into God's hands. So going over those, obviously, again, uh, talking about these eight things that Jesus did, eight principles that he did to help him handle his worst day. Uh, pray through to surrender. Forgive those that have hurt you. Continue to love and serve people. Prioritize your family. Seek God to understand why. Keep your passion. Finish well. And commit your future into God's hands. Boom. That's great. Now, what area do you need to strengthen in your life? And as you go through this with your, with your connect group, uh, maybe as you go through them, you can just share your own personal stories of how you prioritized your family or you, your desires to finish well or your belief in God for a hope-filled future, committing your future into God's hands, uh, you're learning to forgive. Maybe you can share some personal stories or ask for testimonies. Perhaps you can end your connect group saying, let's pray for one another because I know that, we, that in this world we have tribulation. We have very bad days in this world, right? And uh, maybe you're going through that very bad day. And if so, let's pray for you. And uh, maybe there's one or two areas uh, out of these eight points here that you can say, you know, maybe this area needs to be strengthened. Maybe you're falling short of this area. And let it be a time of instruction. But more than that, inspiration and transformation in their life. So use this to pray and minister to one another. Use it to share testimonies of how you've learned these lessons or how God's teaching these, these lessons. I think it's going to be great. All right. So thank you so very much for once again doing Connect Groups. You're helping me disciple, which is a great thing. And I hope that you have a great September. Summer has obviously come to an end. September is starting the fall season. And uh, so summertime is a great time of relaxation. But it's not a great uh, time to really gather people in large numbers because they're so scattered. But September, October, November, they should be coming back. And so stay encouraged, all right? God bless you. Love you.